let's talk about a basic projectile motion model, projectile motion. And when I say projectile motion, I don't just mean up down motion as we've always talked about so far, just going up, then coming back down. I mean, we're gonna actually go up sideways to a degree before coming back down. It's, this is the actual path of the projectile, not just the height of the projectile as a function of time. To do that, we really need to talk more about vectors as we go. So what we're gonna have here is we're gonna have a projectile that's going to be shot out of a cannon, say. So here's the ground. And pretend somebody's dug a hole in the ground and they put a cannon in the ground, something like this. And you're gonna shoot a cannonball out of the ground at a certain angle, at a certain angle, with a certain initial velocity that is a vector. What are vectors? I've briefly talked about vectors before. They are, well, you draw them as arrows. Another way to describe a vector is as a directed quantity. It's got a direction, the direction of the arrow itself. And it is does have a certain length. You could shoot that cannonball out of the cannon fast or slow. The length of the vector gives you the initial speed of the cannonball. And I am going to use velocity and speed in different ways here, definitely different ways. So this is the initial velocity vector. You could call it V sub zero for initial velocity or V naught for short not, I didn't say V not, I said V not, N-A-U-G-H-T, V sub zero. I'm gonna put a little half arrow above it to indicate that this is a vector. It is an arrow. I could put a full arrow above it. We just get a little lazy and put a half arrow, okay? Just cause we're feeling a little lazy. But when we draw the actual vector, we draw a full arrow. So that's the initial velocity. And that means the that at time zero, the cannonball is traveling at that direction at that moment in time. And with a speed equal to the length of this vector, you know, however long I need to draw it to make it to make it right. If we use standard units, I want to think about the length of that being measured in meters per second, even though it's a length. That's kind of strange, but that's what you would want to do. Measure it in meters per second. What's going to happen? I hope it's pretty clear that the path is probably going to look something about like this. That'll be the path of the cannonball. Path of cannonball. Will it be a parabola? Mm, technically not because of air resistance. Now the air resistance on a cannonball is not real strong because the cannonballs, you know, so dense. The air resistance on a feather, if you shot a feather in a, out of a cannon, that would definitely be significant and the path would be far from parabolic. As a first approximation, to keep things as simple as possible today, we're gonna assume no air resistance. So it's like you're shooting the cannonball in a vacuum it'd be a very, very big vacuum situation where you got to pump the air out of some huge underground or some some tent or something and you, you pump the, all the air out somehow. Okay, let's pretend the cannonball is right there at a certain moment in time. What are the forces on the cannonball? There is certainly the force due to gravity pointing straight downward, right? Gravity points straight downward toward the center of the Earth. Now, of course, the Earth is a, a sphere. So depending on where you are, gravity is pointing in different directions. But of course, for modeling sake, for the sake of simplicity, simplicity, we're ignoring the fact that the Earth is round. We're focused on a place where we've got this flat ground. As far as we can see, it seems like the Earth is flat. Okay, I'm not saying the Earth is flat. It just seems that way 
and for modeling purposes, we assume it. That would be the force due to gravity. It is a vector quantity. It's I drew it as an arrow. F grav, I could say. It's got a certain direction downward, and it's got a certain length or magnitude, which I haven't specified yet. That is the strength of the force, you might say. Are there any other forces? Well, if there were air resistance, there would be a force pointing this direction, tangent to the curve, in the opposite direction as the motion. But remember, I'm pretending there is no air resistance for the sake of simplicity, so I'm going to ignore it. That, that's the better way to say it, is I'm going to ignore air resistance and see what happens. In real life, when you do this kind of thing, when you try to apply it, you see what kind of results you would get, like, for example, how far should the cannonball go before it hits the ground? And to test it, to test how good the model is, you'd actually have to measure how far did it actually go? Does the prediction of the math match reality? It will not match it exactly. But if it's pretty good, if it's pretty close, then you're pretty happy with it. Happy enough to like shoot cannonballs at people. I'm not recommending shooting cannonballs at people. Okay, shooting cannonballs at buildings, even, well, that's probably not the greatest application either. Anyway, how do you represent this force due to gravity? What is F grav? We need to use standard unit vectors to help us represent this. Standard unit vectors are vectors of unit length, length one, meter, say, pointing directly to the right, parallel to the ground, and pointing directly upward, perpendicular to the ground. The standard notation for these things is I hat and J hat, and we don't typically bother, bother putting a little dot above, above the I and J, because the hat effectively serves as the dot. Fun conventions, okay. If those are my standard unit vectors, standard unit vectors, I hat and J hat, we do see F grav points downward, straight downward. It's parallel to J hat. It's got zero I hat component. It doesn't point even slightly to the left or to the right. It's a multiple of J hat, and since it's downward, it's a negative multiple of it. It's negative mg times J hat, where m is the mass of the cannonball. Mass of cannonball. G, as always, is the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the earth. I won't write that all out. About 9.8 meters per second per second. 9.8 meters per second squared. I have mentioned before that if you go up to the top of a high mountain, G is a little smaller. It's actually not constant. But for keeping things simple from modeling, we assume it's constant. The negative sign is indicating since J hat points straight upward, this is in the opposite of direction of J hat. It points straight downward. Since J is a unit vector, that means it has length one. The length, the magnitude of this vector is just M times G. In math, well, you often see absolute value signs around the vector, or maybe even if you're feeling extra fancy, double absolute value signs around the vector to indicate the magnitude of the vector magnitude of the vector, meaning its length. Single absolute value signs are fine, but you will often see in math books double absolute value signs. Kind of the reason is we want to emphasize it's a vector. And the double absolute value signs is kind of a way to emphasize it's a vector. Actually, in physics textbooks, they don't even bother drawing any absolute value signs at all. They just write F grab without a vector symbol. Okay, and that represents the magnitude. And maybe in the book, the F grab is bold faced and its magnitude is not bold faced. But in math classes, we kind of like emphasizing this is the magnitude of the vector. It does equal mg. It is a, it's a non-negative quantity. Okay, this is a length. Can't be negative. So I don't want a negative sign there. 
The negative sign here, again, indicates that this is the opposite direction of j hat. So that's the way we represent the force of gravity. And that, in fact, is the total force if we're ignoring air resistance. Now, in the modeling, we use Newton's second law. Newton's second law. What is Newton's second law? The total force, which if you've got more than one force, if you've got gravity and you've got air resistance, you've got to add them. You've got to add the vectors to get the total force in that case. And if there was air resistance pointing in this direction here, the sum of these two vectors would be pointing in that direction there. I'm not going to draw it because we're ignoring air resistance equals m times a, right? The acceleration, mass times acceleration. Most of the time in basic physics classes, this is a scalar equation. The scalar f equals m times the acceleration. But here it does apply when you've got vectors. And in fact, a, the acceleration is a vector. This is a differential equation in disguise. Section 6.3 in the textbook is about differential equations. I'm not going to explicitly test you on it on the final exam, but if you want to read section 6.3, it's about differential equations. This is a differential equation in disguise. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. I could replace A with dv dt, and notice I'm writing that as a vector too. And by the way here, a and V do depend on time, in, in the abstract at least. Actually, acceleration vector is going to be constant when we only assume there's the force of gravity. But if we assume there was friction, the acceleration vector would actually not be constant. It would depend on time. But the, the velocity vector does change over time. It is a function of T. Starts out pointing in this direction, right? Cannonball is coming out of the cannon in this direction with a certain length. As the cannonball moves along the arc, the velocity vector changes. How? Well, it certainly changes direction. It's going like this. My pen is the velocity vector. It's certainly changing direction. It's always tangent to the curve. At this given moment in time, the velocity vector is about like this. That's the velocity vector at a certain moment in time. And guess what? It's not only changing direction, right? It's, this one's not pointing quite as steep as this one down here. It's not only changing direction, it's also changing length. I hope it makes some intuitive sense that the minimum speed is at the peak and the velocity vector should be shortest there. Shouldn't it be that? That, that should make some intuitive sense <clears throat> that the velocity vector is as small as possible when you're at the peak. This is the velocity vector at some time t1. This is the velocity vector at some other time t2. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe I should call it t sub max because we're at the time of the maximum height, perhaps. Should point straight to the right and have a minimum length. The speed, which is the length of the velocity vector, should be minimized there. The point I'm just trying to make here, though, down here is, is V is a function of T. Can we solve this differential equation for V as a function of T? Yes, that's what our goal is now. The total force, again, is just the force of gravity. That's just this thing right here. I can replace F total with this thing, negative M G J hat. And I can replace ultimately this with what? Hmm. M times dV dt, but what is dV dt? Huh. I need to write V in terms of its components. The position vector, position vector, R of t could be thought of as X of t i hat plus Y of t j hat, where x of t and y of t really are two components of a parametric curve. 
If you graph that parametric curve, you would get the path of motion. Its derivative is the velocity vector. V of t is dr dt. And I hope it makes some intuitive sense that that should be a vector whose first component is x prime of t and whose second component is y prime of t. And that is what you want to do. What's the acceleration vector? A of t is dv dt. Take the derivatives of x prime and y prime. Get x double prime of t times i hat plus y double prime of t times j hat. I can replace dv dt, I should have put a little vector symbols here, with this thing. x double prime of t i hat plus y double prime of t j hat. Now, it's, now, you won't always see people use this notation. Sometimes they might say this is a sub x and a sub y for the first and second components of the acceleration vector, but this is fine to do it this way. I can then multiply the m through here, here and here, distributive property and write it like this. And now what I do is I take this one vector differential equation, the equality of this with this, and break it into two separate scalar differential equations by matching up the components. Now, the force doesn't have any i hat component, does it? Zero times i hat. But ma does, it's m times x double prime. That means m times x double prime is zero. Because this term over here doesn't have any i hats in it. This one does. That m times x double prime has got to be zero. By the way, well, okay. Actually, let me do something else first. I could cancel the m's, by the way. I don't need the m's. The mass doesn't matter. It does matter if you include air resistance, but it doesn't matter if you do not include air resistance, if you ignore air resistance. So actually I get X double prime of T is zero. And Y double prime of T is what? Compare, it's gotta be negative G. The M's canceled. Y double prime of T has gotta be negative G. And now to find the velocity and ultimately the position, I just integrate. These are differential equations for X and Y individually. They're simple differential equations. If X double prime of T equals zero for all T, that means X prime of T is a constant. What constant would it be? Let's call it C first for constant. It's the first component of the velocity vector. I'm saying the first component of the velocity vector is always going to be the same. It's going to be a number, a constant. It's got to be the same as the first component of the initial velocity. What is that? Where is that in this picture? It's this effectively distance right there. Label that maybe V sub zero sub x, two subscripts. Ugh. Are you okay with that? The sub, the sub zero means that's the initial velocity and the x means it's the first component, the x component. V sub zero sub x. Maybe I should put parentheses around the V sub zero, but I won't bother. You'll sometimes see this in science classes. It's a constant, a constant. And we can also integrate that to find the position. Integrate a constant. I could even write an integral sign if I like. With respect to what? With respect to t, t is the variable here. I'm gonna get that constant, v sub zero sub x times t plus another constant. 
What's the other constant? I'll call it C here as well, but it's a different C. Uh, the answer is it depends. It depends on what the initial X coordinate of the cannonball is at time zero. What's the X coordinate of the cannonball at time zero? Uh, I don't know. I never said. Ah, choose coordinates to make it zero. That's a bright idea. Choose a coordinate system so that the cannonball is starting out at position zero at time zero. Actually, I should make the x-axis level with the ground. I didn't quite draw it that way, but that would be the best way to think to do. The cannonball is supposed to be at ground level at time zero. That's where it's where we start measuring time to keep things simple. Choosing coordinates is helpful for simplifying the math. So we just get V zero sub X, that's a constant times T. If initial position is the origin zero, zero, both for X and for Y. So X is a linear function of T. V, zero, v sub zero sub x is a constant. What about y? y double prime of t is negative g. Integrate that to find y prime. Get negative gt plus a constant. What constant is it? Well, when you plug in t equals zero into here, you got to get the initial y component of the initial velocity, right? Because t is zero, that makes that zero. That's got to be V sub zero sub Y. In all this, the initial velocity vector V sub zero can be written as V sub zero sub X times I hat plus V sub zero times Y times J hat. That's in the background in my mind. And then I can integrate again to find Y of T I won't bother writing an integral sign this time. I'm going to get negative. Hey, we've seen this kind of thing before. G over 2 T squared plus V sub 0 sub Y times T plus the initial plus another constant. That'll be the initial height. Ah, take it to be 0. I'm at initial position 0, 0 when T is 0. My initial height is 0. I don't have to bother writing anything else. You might be wondering, what about thinking about the initial angle? Could I think about the angle? Should I think about the angle? The answer is you could. You don't have to necessarily, unless it helps you solve some problem. If this is the initial velocity, that's V sub zero sub X I hat there. And this is V sub zero sub Y J hat. It would be making some angle here, theta, that would be the initial angle of the launch. And you could use trigonometry to relate these things. If you know the angle and you know the length of this vector, you could use trigonometry to figure out V sub zero sub X and V sub zero sub Y. I don't think I'm going to bother doing that. It could be done. What I'm more interested in now, though, is using these equations that X of T equals this and y of t equals this to animate this in Mathematica, figure out the speed, and I do mean speed, not velocity, and figure out the distance traveled by doing a definite integral. Let's go to Mathematica now. I will go ahead and type here initially g is 9.8. But by doing it this way, by typing G in there like that, it, it's going to give me the flexibility to change G if I wanted to, which would be a good thing if you want to go to, to the moon or to Mars, because right on the moon or Mars, G changes, or to the top of a tall mountain. You can see how things will change a little bit. Of course, when you're on the top of a tall mountain, then the ground's not flat. So uh, yeah, well. And what do I want V sub zero to be? Is that worth typing in here. Uh, maybe I'll type it like this. V sub zeros, V at zero X. <laughs> Pretend those are subscripts. I won't bother making them subscripts. Let's let that be um, 10 meters per second. So that's the 
I should probably make it bigger. 100 meters per second. That's the horizontal component of the initial velocity. And that's going to stay constant all the time. V zero Y, pretend those are subscripts, will be the vertical component of the initial velocity. That will not stay constant. The, I mean, the vertical component won't. This, this number will be a constant. Let's pretend that's 50. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do here? We want to type in R of T. The Effectively, the position vector at first. What am I going to use? I'm going to use the equations I was just showing you. Maybe, maybe, maybe for extra emphasis, I should type x of t and y of t first. x of t is going to be, if I can type, colon equals v0x times t. v0x times t, I typed as an o instead of a zero at first. That's just using this equation right there. A y of t, is going to be this other one. By the way, might have been better to call these f and g instead of x and y to emphasize their functions. I mean, I'm abusing notation, okay? But that's a common thing to do. Negative g over 2 t squared plus v zero y times t. You do need the stars in there for the multiplication. I don't want to just type v zero y t because then Mathematica thinks that's all one variable. I either need a space or a star to play it safe. Uh, possibly, I'm not going to look into it though. And then to get Mathematica to represent this as a vector, I can put it in a list with curly braces like this. Then I can define the velocity vector to be the derivative of the position vector. And Mathematica will differentiate component by component. If I say, hey, Mathematica, what's the formula for this velocity vector? There it is right there. 100 is the derivative of... 100 times t, v0 is x, x is 100, and the 50 minus 9.8 t is the derivative of this. That's 50 t, its derivative is 50. This is negative 4.9 t squared. Its derivative is negative 9.8 t. That is the velocity vector. I could also even enter the acceleration vector and see its formula. The acceleration vector is the derivative of the velocity vector. There's the velocity vector. Here's the acceleration vector. Oh, constant, doesn't depend on t. It's pointing straight down with a length of negative 9.8. Yeah, that's the acceleration due to gravity as a vector. Its magnitude is positive 9.8. The number g. If I use parametric plot inside manipulate, I will see the path of the motion. Parametric plot, because it is a parametric curve, I'm plotting R of T, that's the position vector, as a point effectively. Parametric plot treats it as a point. How far should we go out horizontally? It's going 100 meters per second to the right at time zero, and in fact, all the time. I don't know exactly how long it's gonna be in the air. Let's just guess 10 seconds at first. So I better go out to like a thousand or so to be able to see the path in the X direction. And who knows, maybe up to, uh, I don't know, 500 in the Y direction to see the path. So we should see the path of the object here. I think I need to do this to keep the origin where it should be the whole time. It's a little funny. Here's the path of the cannonball. There it is. Hey, that was a pretty good guess. And it is a function of, it is traveling over time. And it is, it's hard to tell, it's going a little slower there at the top than at the ends. The speed is not constant. What is the speed? The speed is the length of the velocity vector. The speed 
as a function of t is the magnitude or length of the velocity vector by the Pythagorean theorem. Thinking about an arbitrary velocity vector here. It's got to be the length of the hypotenuse there. It's a right triangle. Square root of the sum of the squares of the sides. Square root, really, of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. And for this example, this is a general fact, by the way, that I just wrote down there. That is always the speed in any situation like this for two-dimensional motion. For, th for three-dimensional motion, like a bug flying around, then you need a third component, a plus z prime of t squared, a third component being called z. What's x prime? It's this constant. What's y prime? It's this linear function right there. This is going to be v sub zero sub x squared plus negative gt plus v sub zero sub y squared. Simplify this if you like. The v sub zero sub x just stays as is, square it. I'll get rid of the parentheses, square that. You got a foil, I'll get plus g squared t squared minus two g v sub zero sub y t plus v sub zero sub y squared. Huh. It's a quadratic function underneath a square root. Does that make it a linear function? No. You cannot take the square root of each of these terms to simplify it. Can't do it. Though if you graph it, it'll probably be somewhat curved at first, but then maybe maybe somewhat straight. Well, it's gotta it's gotta go down. Okay, let's just see what happens here. Yeah, it's it's definitely not a linear function. In Mathematica, let's see, I could do this. I could see if Mathematica wants to simplify x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared for me based on using v sub zero sub x is 100 and v sub zero sub y is 50. Okay. Expand or simplify. There it is. The speed as a function of t has got to be the square root of that. Copy and paste. Oops, I don't like that it puts a bunch of other decimals in there. It's just, it's it's related to how it's representing the numbers internally. Let's just get rid of all those extra decimal places. There it is. There's the speed as a function of t. It's not constant. It's not linear. It's a square root of a quadratic. What does its graph look like? Kind of like a parabola but it's not it looks like a parabola but it's really not actually if you made the the graph over a bigger value range of values of t something like that it looks pretty straight at the extremes that's because it's getting closer to a straight line it's asymptotic to straight lines as t gets bigger, plus or minus. It's definitely not a parabola. Parabolas don't do that. It just looks like a parabola when t goes from zero to 10. So the speed is maximized at the start and when it hits the ground. Does it hit the ground at t equals 10? Probably not. Uh, I could solve for when y of t equals zero, is it t equals 10? 10.2 uh, is when it hits the ground. Time 10.2 is when you're back to the starting feet speed effectively. Speed of time zero is that speed at time 10.2 is gonna be very close to that. 
The speed should be minimized halfway between perhaps 5.1. How would we test that? We'd want to take the derivative. There it is, yikes. Uh, though it's, it's a derivative you should be able to calculate if I asked you to. You'd have to use the chain rule. We got essentially all of this to the one half power. We'd bring down the one half, make it a negative one half power, then multiply times the derivative of the inside. The negative one half power comes as a square root down here. Where is this equal to zero? Solve for where the speed equals zero or the derivative of the speed is zero. That is try to minimize the speed. Yeah, at about 5.1. The minimum speed is about 100, 100 meters per second. Hey, oh, yeah, it had to be. That's the horizontal component of the velocity. When it's at the peak, the vertical component is zero. Ah. By the way, when I calculate the derivative of the speed, I'm not finding the acceleration. That's not the, acceler the same as the acceleration. The acceleration is a vector. It's the derivative of the velocity. The derivative of the speed is just the derivative of the speed. That's all it is. Kind of related to acceleration, but not the acceleration. You should also be able to integrate this to find the distance traveled along this parabola. Or Yeah, the path actually is a parabola. I didn't explain why. What's the distance traveled? Integrate the speed from zero to about 10.2. Can Mathematica do this integral symbolically? Maybe I should do an indefinite integral first. Can it do the indefinite integral symbolically? Let's see, I don't know. I think it can, there it is, ha ha ha. You get to do this in Calc too, ha ha ha. Yikes, what log? Yeah, and remember log in mathematics is natural log. That's a natural log in there. Somehow when you integrate the speed function, where is it? This thing, somehow a logarithm comes into play. What? Integrals are pretty mysterious. How does that happen? It's not clear. Could I do it? Probably if I had enough time. Though I'd probably, I think I'd probably find it easier to integrate in the unexpanded form than the expanded form. I, I think I know some tricks to do it in that form more easily. Crazy logarithm. Do you have to do that integral for the test? No. Will you have to in Calc 2? Probably not. Unless I put it on a take-home portion or something. I give you a take-home. Uh, can you do the... The definite integral, sure, if you've got this function, that's an antiderivative, do f of 10.2 to minus f of zero, where this is capital F. What should it be? It should be the length of that parabola. Turns out to be about 1,061. And that is the approximate area under the speed graph, 1,061, does it seem reasonable? What's the area of the entire box here? 10 times 120, 1,200. Yeah, we got a little less than 1,200, 1,061 is the area under this curve. We could try to do Riemann sums to approximate it. There are, there's a video, one of the videos I'll share with you, either the Calc 1 exam three review or the Calc 1 final exam review that I'll share shortly after class today. One of those videos, I do do a problem like this in a simpler situation that does involve trying to estimate an area under a graph with the left-hand sum or right-hand sum, or maybe even just by counting boxes, we could add some grid lines in here. There's a bunch of boxes, each with area two times 20, each with area 40, representing 40 meters, Count how many boxes total are underneath here. Well, this part, there's what? One, two, three, four, five times one, two, three, four, five, 25 such boxes, each of area 40. 25 times 40 is 1,000. The area of this box here is 1,000. I, I mean, I know that already is 10 times 100 as well. And then you got partial boxes here and here and here and here. 
You could try to estimate the total number of boxes, maybe around 26, 26 times 40. It's getting close to 1,061, 1,040. It's a little bit more than 26 boxes. Box counting comes up in some exam review videos as well. If you got a grid line like graph paper, you should be able to use those boxes to estimate areas under curves too. The principle still holds. However you want to do it, you want to estimate the area of the curve with Riemann sums or estimating areas of boxes, total number of boxes times the area of each box using technology or using the fundamental theorem of calculus in a simpler situation. You can do the integral. You can try to approximate the distance traveled. Okay. That's a lot of information. You don't need to know all of it. I'm Focus on big ideas, especially the idea that integrating the speed gives the distance traveled. As an antiderivative, when you do an indefinite integral, and as an actual distance when you do a definite integral, and it gives you the area under the curve. Actually, it's possible that this integral is not the distance traveled, but this function, because the distance traveled at time zero should be zero. You don't see a plus C here, but it's possible that this expression right here um, does not have a value of zero at t equals zero. No, it doesn't. It's got a value of negative 3,701.45. I had no idea what that was going to be. To get the true distance traveled function as a function of time, you want dist of zero to be zero, no distance traveled at time zero. You'd have to add 3,701.45 to this function. Effectively shift its graph up by that amount to make sure its graph goes to the origin if you were graphing the distance traveled. Maybe we should graph that. Plot this function. plus, plus 3,701.45 as t goes from zero to 100. There is my distance traveled function. I'm not sure why this looks the way it does. It should look different. It should look actually concave down at first before concave up. It should look more like that. And it's not matching this integral at Oh, well, that's because I maybe it's because I'm going out too far. Ten, you go up to time ten. That's a little bit better. Now that looks almost straight. Um, it's not straight. It just looks straight. It's ever so slightly concave down in here, and once you get past t equals five point zero two, then it's ever so slightly concave up there. And at time ten or so, you get the total distance traveled. Ten point two is what I'd really want to go out to. Looks almost straight. The speed doesn't change. The uh, speed doesn't change very much. The speed graph again. I mean, on a yes, it changes from about 112 to down to 100 or so, then back up to about 112. But on this scale, when you graph the distance traveled function, it looks like the speed's constant. It looks straight here. It's not. 